Okay, can you guys hear me okay? I can. Okay, I just want to make sure because I was going to try to use my my work computer or have a headset, but um, that didn't work out. So, all righty. So, um, I apologize if this is too simple or this is too difficult. I have not given a lecture to other physicians for a while, so I tried to. Oh, this is the wrong lecture anyway. Um, I tried to keep the basics and then try to make sure we have enough time at the end to discuss because I believe that's kind of the most important part. Um, but I am scheduled to do another one next month. So please give me feedback if that's possible. If you want something more in depth on the diagnostic, if you want to focus more on treatment, if you want more discussion time, just kind of let me know um, and interrupt me today as we go if you need to, please. All right, now let's see. Slide to the oh, so someone's covering this up. Okay, so these are our three learning objectives for today. Hey, come here, please. Sorry, the, the joys of working from home. Um, so we're gonna discuss the diagnostic criteria of depressive of major depression specifically, and then I'm gonna discuss some screening tools that you guys can use in clinical practice. And then we'll also discuss the most common pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatment options in kiddos. Um, there we go. Okay, so when it comes to the depressive disorders, according to the DSM, we have major depression, we've got disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, persistent depressive disorder, which was previously called dysthymia. And then there is bipolar, depression, and then of course the depression due to medical condition or substance use. Um, today, I'm just working on major depressive disorder. I was trying to fit in DMDD as well, um, but it, there just wasn't enough time. So again, if you have questions, so we'll bring it up at the end. Um, so for major depressive disorder, the CPT code is F33 point, and then the numbers after that change based on your um, whether or not it's recurrent or a single episode, if it's mild, moderate, severe, that kind of stuff is where those numbers change. So I didn't put those all in here. Okay, so, oops, I'm gonna put that on a bit. All right, so when it comes to major depression, we need five or more of this group of seven symptoms or eight symptoms, I guess, that are present in the same two weeks, nearly every single day. And this functioning represents a change from previous functioning. And then just a reminder that you must have one of these two or the child must have one of these two, the depressed mood or the anhedonia. Um, and then at least four more of these, or you can have both of these and three of these. So this is our lovely little mnemonic that we learned back in med school, which is SIG ECAPS plus mood because that mood portion with the anhedonia are the two mandatory um, components. So it's, so the S, uh, stands for sleep changes. I is interest or anhedonia. G is guilt, um, which I tend to also lump in those feelings of worthlessness. Um, or here we go, the excessive inappropriate guilt. Um, e is energy. Um, typically tends to be a lot lower than typical. C is concentration. Um, or you might even see, especially in older ones, it's maybe a little more indecisiveness or maybe a worsening of um, organization, functioning, concentration type of things. A is appetite. Um, and mm, so basically I'll ask kids, because of course kids are growing, they, they're supposed to gain weight, right? Um, so I'll ask a lot of kids to like, especially my adolescents, do you feel like your clothes are fitting the same as they did a month or two ago? You know, so either they're losing weight without trying or they're gaining weight without trying. Um, for kids, especially those younger ones, you can also state that they're not gaining as expected. So when you're doing your growth chart, so maybe they haven't actually lost weight, but they're, they're not progressing, then that could also count as this bullet point. Um, and then P is psychomotor changes. So either agitation or retardation. So this is that the blob on the couch is wanting to get out of bed, has no energy for anything, won't move, ends up moving slowly. Um, but in kids, I also tend to see more psychomotor agitation where 
more so it's an increase in irritability. So they're just more snappy about things or just way less tolerant. So if they're asked, you know, they're in a household, you're 10 years old, I'm going to ask you to help clean off the table or do the dishes. And like a kid still may be kind of like, I don't want to, but these kiddos are just, it's more than that. And it's like every little thing that's asked is just daunting. It's, or I actually have kids that become somewhat aggressive. They're throwing stuff. They're more reactive. That could be because of depression. And then the last S is regarding suicidal thoughts. Um, I'll also lump in urges for self-injury or thoughts of self-injury or engagement in self-injury here. Um, and we'll discuss some of that stuff a little bit later. So there's our diagnostic criteria. Um, I think I pointed out a few of these. So I, I talked about the irritable mood or kids will just constantly complain of being bored. Um, that can be a sign of depression. It can also, also obviously be a bunch of other things too, but um, we talked about the gaining weight. Oh, somatic complaints. So these kiddos might also just have a lot more, I guess, reasons to not do things. And I don't think they're lying. They're not making up and saying they have a headache so they can't do something or they have a tummy ache because so they don't have to do something. But um, it's kind of just their way. So if they don't understand the psychological pain of depression, then it almost will like force itself to manifest as a physical thing. And so then that they can actually explain a little bit better. Um, social withdrawal, which is relatively common for depression, um, or just worsening school performance. And that's one of my first, that's one of my questions I ask at every single follow-up, every single patient is, how are you doing in school this year? How does that compare to your usual? What, you know, what is different? Is it, you can't keep up? Is it that you don't care? There are different answers. And then that can kind of point into different directions as to what may be contributing. Um, Probably one of the hardest parts about kids with depression, especially when it comes to safety, is that kids tend to be much more impulsive with their suicide attempts than adults. And so they can be harder to predict. Um, I feel like when I was in middle school and high school, they kind of gave us this little education piece, like, hey, if your friends are like giving away their property to people and talking about the end days, you know, be concerned. And that's true. Like that will happen in adolescence sometimes, but I would say much more commonly it is they've been depressed, they are depressed, they're having a hard time dealing with it. And then there's like one big stressor or there's a culmination of a few smaller stressors and in one moment, and then they're alone, no one's there. They feel even more like a burden. They feel like everybody's better off without them. No one would care. And then they go and they find a sharp object or they find some pills to take or they find something else potentially more lethal and they make their suicide attempt. Um, so, um, like after this, we'll get to some of that safety planning and things that you can do with the child and the parents. So epidemiology, because that's what we do in medicine. So depression is still not a common diagnosis, but I would say relatively compared to many other mental health diagnoses, it is one of our most common um, definitely more common in adolescents that three to 8% of adolescents is actually relatively similar to adult prevalence rates of depression. Um, prior to puberty, this, when it's down to that one to 2% of children, those basically the elementary school kiddos, early middle school, it's equal boys and girls, but once they hit puberty, it's girls two or three times more than boys, but I still have a decent amount of boys with depression. Um, I got, I can't remember where I got this data, like this average duration, um, especially if they're coming in for treatment. Um, I think the biggest thing to be concerned about is the recurrence rates. So when parents come in and you're saying, okay, this is what's going on. This is how we're going to treat it what do we expect coming forward? So even once they remit and they're doing well, there's a 40% chance that they're going to have another depressive episode within the next two years and 70% chance that they'll have another episode within the next five years. Um, it's found that pre pubertal depression seems to be more related to environment, um, stressors, things like that, then related to biology, but it still is going to increase their chances for depressive symptoms as they get older. Um, 
And then if you're ever asked, number one risk factor is family history. Okay, now the assessment of safety and suicide. Um, I think this is, I mean, this is what I remember taught to me in med school when I didn't know I was gonna do psychiatry, but um, it's really about just asking the direct questions. Like the data is overwhelming that you're not gonna put thoughts of suicide in their head if you're asking about it. And when it comes to kids and adolescents, I think for the most part, they feel a certain amount of relief that someone is finally just asking. Um, but it's very important to do so in a non-judgmental manner. Um, and even like with the screening questionnaires, because I know a lot of those times, especially if you're doing like a PHQ-2, you might not actually give them a rating scale. You might, it just might be built into your EMR where your nurse assessment person is asking the two questions. Um, but remember that as physicians, the buck stops with us. So I would really encourage you all to still ask the PHQ two questions at minimum at any visit, even if you already know that your staff did. Um, and this is more so because from a, I guess a personal standpoint, when I have gone for my own doctor's visits or my own child's visits, I've had a really good handful of times where that person goes, well, you're not having suicidal thoughts, are you? Well, then if I was, I, you've already told me that it's not okay for me to tell you that I am. So especially if you don't know for a fact that your person doing that assessment is asking those in an open-ended way, it probably would be worthwhile to ask them yourself. Um, but so I tend to start, like I don't go into all these questions for everyone. It's always dependent on what their other answers were. So now that I know that they've got a lot of depressive symptoms, then I'll typically ask at first, like, well, any thoughts wishing you were dead or not wanting to be alive anymore? Because that one tends to make a lot more sense, especially for the really young kids. Um, and then, okay, yeah, I have. Well, actually feeling like you should kill yourself, like you should be dead. It would be better off for your family. Um, and then if you get a yes, then, then it's like, well, have you ever thought of how you would do it? Um, if they've thought about how, have they ever tried getting the things that they needed so if they've thought about hanging themselves have they started collecting a rope have they chosen where they would do that um if it's you know if they thought they'd take an overdose like do you know where the pills are have you researched which pills you would take do you have them at home have you ever dumped the pills into your hand and considered taking them or stopped doing that um those kind of things um I would, especially for, I was like, no, even the younger kids, I, I would encourage you, especially when they're coming in and really have a lot of depressive symptoms, which you're going to do with partly with the parents in the room. Um, but I would really encourage to try to do a little bit of a separate time and meet with the child alone and especially do this initial safety assessment with them in the alone, alone. Every once in a while, I'll get a kid that's like super anxious or doesn't feel like they don't want their parent to leave. Um, I will leave, I'll let the parents stay for this. Um, but I, I definitely have some concerns that sometimes I'm not going to get the full truth from the kid because even a young kid knows that these thoughts aren't safe. They may say they're not good, not, you know, but I, I would say that they understand that and they understand that that if they say these things, it's going to upset or scare their parents, especially if they have an appropriate type of attachment. Um, so that's the biggest reason why I encourage you separate at least for a little while, but then you bring the parent back in for when we're talking about safety planning, which is the next. So now you've got a kid there that has been having some suicidal thoughts or has some plans. I would say once I get to the point of where either there are just so many symptoms of depression, even if the kid is not have or re not reporting suicidal thoughts. I will still typically have a safety planning meeting with them and the parent. Once the child actually tells you they're having suicidal thoughts, then for sure we need to have this talk. Um, and then I like the kid to be in the room because I like them to be part of this and it helps to teach them that like, this is your illness and we're here to support you, but you need to kind of, you need to help us. We can't read your mind. We don't know what you're thinking. We don't know what you're feeling. Um, Cause I've even had kids tell that I was like, well, will you help your parent when you get home? And let's say if they've been having a history of cutting, well, a lot of these kids are hiding razors in their room or they're hiding something somewhere. And you say, hey, will you give that to mom when you get home? 
like I'll kind of make them open up in the office and so I give basically the parents a little more leverage when they get home of like hey remember you said that you'd give me that um because we're really trying to just set them up for safety I talk to parents about this is like baby proofing your house when you have a toddler okay unfortunately we are basically trying to safety proof our house for our child who has an illness that increases their chances of wanting to harm themselves so First and foremost is, is restricting access to really lethal means, firearms um, being number one, knives, sharp objects, things like that. Um, over time, my, my spiel has changed a little bit, especially living and working in a state that is very, I guess where gun ownership I feel is a lot more common than where I did my training. Um, so rather than outright asking them if they own guns, I have started to shift and I say, you know, if you have firearms or guns in the home, I would really str most strongly encourage that you get them out of the home, whether you have a friend or a family member that you trust that could just essentially take physical ownership. They're still yours, but they can just take guardianship, custodianship, I guess, for a while. Um, I tend to recommend at least three months, especially when we're in this acute phase of depression because that is the highest risk time for a suicide attempt. Um, and just say, hey, if you guys are going hunting, go hunting, but we really wanna limit access. If they're not willing, or if, and I don't even ask if they're willing or not. I say, if that's not possible, um, then you really ought to have an, I mean, you know, a safe for your guns. And best case scenario is you're even you are storing the guns separately from ammunition and they are both in locked cases or safes or whatever. Um, and again, some parents will start coming, oh, they can't. I'm like, I, I believe that you're, you're doing your best, but in these moments, we need to make it as hard as possible. So if there are two locks that they have to get through before they can actually load a gun, that's gonna take more time. And that gives the child more time for that thought and that desire to harm themselves to pass. Um, and then other things like, um, if they do have any pills in the house, which most families do, they strongly encourage them to buy a medication lockbox. They can typically get them at CVS or Walmart. They get them on Amazon. For the most part, they're 20 to $30. Um, and I really, I counsel them on over-the-counter medications like Tylenol, aspirin, Benadryl. As we know, those tend to be actually way more lethal than a lot of our prescription medications. So I said, you got to lock all those up. Like no one has an emergency headache, but they need a Tylenol right now. Um, so that they, and pretty much just the two, if there's two adults in the house, they're the only ones that have the combination to the safe. Um, sometimes I'll talk about locks on doors, um, cause a lot of houses have locks on bedroom doors. Well, although they tend to be somewhat chintzy in a moment that you really feel like your child is in danger on the other side, it might feel like Fort Knox. It might be really hard to get through. Um, so I talked to them and again, that's really kind of depending on the severity of the kid in that moment. Um, I say, you know, you may consider removing that lock from the door for a while, just saying they still have their privacy. They can still close their door, but they can't lock that door. Um, then the last part of it is with regards to lethality in the home, the kitchen, I would say has the highest percentage of lethal options, but I still have never been in a kitchen that has doors that can lock someone into it. Um, so the second most lethal room in the house is the bathroom. Uh, a lot of people store chemicals in there, um, but there's also a shower head. And so for the most part, plumbing for like a shower head is actually very strong. And so unfortunately there are, there are videos online, all sorts of them that show kids how they can hang themselves from the shower head. Um, and again, I don't want these poor parents like looking around the house to, for all these disaster places, but these to me are the highest risk, highest probability, highest lethality type of options. So we say, you know, the other thing would be just really consider taking that lock off the bathroom door. Now, everybody deserves their privacy in the bathroom so they can close the door, use the bathroom, but they don't need to lock it. Why do we need to lock the bathroom door inside the house? And so obviously if they have other, there may be other situations, but um, I will say that I will say, especially if a kiddo has been cutting quite a bit and the parents are just like, I don't know if I can have them on a line of sight. Tell them it is appropriate to remove their bedroom door. CPS will not count that as neglect, especially if this is the scenario. Um, because a lot of parents are worried about that. I'm like, no, they don't need to. I don't want them. I want those kids having their 
privacy and having their safe space. But if they're showing repeatedly that they can't stay safe, they need to be in line of sight, then that just might be the solution. Um, so I would say if you have this assessment, you have this discussion and you feel like, okay, obviously there's a little increased chance because this kid has depression, but right now I'm not concerned about imminent dangerousness. I think they can go home. Great. But then I'd also still probably send them home with phone numbers for the local crisis center. So in North Dakota, um, every one of the human service centers has an on-call person 24 seven. Okay. So although our primary goal is to serve our population, our clinical population, if someone calls after hours to that crisis center, they're going to help them out. Um, maybe your clinic or your hospital has an associated program, give them that number. Um, or they can call 988, which is the new 911 for mental health emergencies. Um, so the rollout, I'm not completely sure on. I know there's been a few hiccups, but it's supposed to be live. I haven't heard anything else more specifically on 988. Um, so unfortunately, I can't give you a whole lot more data, but that's that's what it was has been funded for. It's supposed to be for um, people with suicidal thoughts or any other mental health crisis, and hopefully they can respond to it a little more, I guess, appropriately than a 911 call would be. Um, Let's see, what else? Oh, we wanna to try to modify any risk factors that we can. So is there substance use with this kid or the family? Is there chaotic home environment that can be addressed in a you know, somewhat short time and then over time? Um, social stressors or social engagement. So a lot of kids, especially the younger ones, um, a lot of their depression comes from bullying or feeling like they don't fit in. Um, and so trying to figure out, is there a plan this parent can go, like, where's the bullying taking place? Can the parent advocate for this kid to be separated from that bully or from those situations? Um, and then also if you've got a kid that is very impulsive, we want to try and do our best to address that typically with medication. Um, because again, those suicidal, um, attempts tend to be impulsive. So if we can lessen their impulsivity, that can also be helpful. Um, screening tools that you guys might be, you're probably more, honestly, more comfortable with these than I am because by the time they come to me, I'm not screening anymore. So I'm doing assessments and treatment, but, um, oops, I forgot to put the year. I think it was 2015 or 2016, I believe is when the USPSTF changed their recommendations. So prior to that for pediatrics, um, ob gyne I think maybe family practice, the recommendation was to screen for depression in your patients as long as you had access to um, someone you could refer them to for treatment. Um, but over time, they realized that's just not good enough. That's not cutting it. We're not, we're not screening the way we should. So um, it's been since, like I said, the mid- 20 teens that the recommendation is children 12 and older are screened at, I believe it's every clinic visit. Typically at this age, it's a lot of times only once a year, but um, just doing the primary screening. So like you talked about earlier, there's the PHQ-2, which is just two questions about depression, one of which I think is has suicidal thoughts or the PHQ-9, which actually goes through the symptoms of depression. Um, there's the short moods and feelings questionnaire, which has the nice thing about this is it has a child version and a parent version. So you can get like two perspectives on what's going on. Um, the Beck depression inventory is what I tend to use in my clinic, but that one is copyrighted. So it costs money. Um, the children's depression rating scale or the Columbia depression scale, they have all shown validity in research studies. I really don't think one is better than the other. I think it's just whatever your clinic has chosen to use, use it. Just know the parameters as to what is the cutoff for being, you know, predictive of depressive symptoms and really investigating more after that. Um, okay, treatment. So this lovely Venn diagram over here is a reminder of how many. Um, so we've got basically three hormones that are really affecting mood. Um, dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, and then kind of where each one is a little more strongly associated. So sometimes I'll remind myself of this um, to discuss treatment options. So if we're having someone that's having way more issues with attention and motivation in the depression, like 
I might try to find a medication that leans more heavily on dopamine. If there's a lot of comorbid anxiety, I'll rely more on the serotonin or the norepinephrine, um, that kind of stuff. But that being said, for you guys being first line, I would recommend you stick with the SSRIs. So fluoxetine is FDA approved for ages eight and up for major depression and escitalopram is FDA approved for ages 12 and up. Now, most insurances will allow other SSRIs. So the others would be um, Zoloft, which is sertraline or Celexa, which is citalopram. Um, to be used because they are the same class. These are just the two that got the FDA approval, but the others didn't go for it. Um, Vibrid or Velazidone is a relatively new medication as they probably came out. Well, it's probably around 2015, um, which says it's an SSRI, but it also has a couple other, I think it's got some other serotonin modulating properties. It hasn't been studied in kids, so I'd probably stay away from that one, even though it's still, if you look it up, it would be in that class. Um, but so for the most part, you're going to get these approved by insurance. I, in my notes, I'm always documenting whether it's an off-label. So if, um, I would say probably the only reason I'll start with, with um, Zoloft instead of one of these two is if I have like a pretty strong family history, like mom's like, yeah, I tried fluoxetine, I tried SNF, they just didn't work, or they may be more agitated, but I'm still on sertraline. It's the best one for me. Like, if I have that family history, I'm probably just going to start them on sertraline. Or if there's a big obsessive compulsive component to their anxiety, I'm a little more likely to do sertraline because there's a little more data in the use of sertraline for OCD. Um, but fluoxetine is also really strong in that realm. So I would, that's kind of usually what guides me. Um, otherwise it's really, they all show equal benefit and we'll talk to, about that next i think um and then non pharmacologic options are therapy always therapy depends on the age of the child a lot of times i'm pushing more for family therapy than individual therapy because the younger kids have a hard time remember developmentally when they're still in that concrete operational stage of piaget they're not the best at truly understanding this hypothetical and like these moods and emotions and thoughts like some of that can be higher ordered thinking than they're actually developmentally capable of doing um which i find a lot of times though that therapists that they get referred to forget that um because the vast majority of training programs train to adults and then some people trickle down and also see kids but they're not small adults they are children and so they're still developing. So sometimes I will find that traditional talk therapy doesn't help these kids unless you have someone who understands the developmental process and comes at it from that angle. Um, but the evidence-based modes of therapy that can help with depression are cognitive behavioral therapy or interpersonal therapy. And then like any other illness, we're, we're offering medication and lifestyle changes. So do they actually have good sleep hygiene? What is their social engagement? Can we try and change their social circle? Would that make a difference? That kind of stuff. Um, I know there is a diet, is it called the sad diet? I think that some people will push, I don't discuss that one too much unless I have a family that comes in really specifically asking about it because I don't feel like the data is very overwhelming. But um, there are some things there, especially, or if they're if their low mood is kind of related to being bullied because of their weight, that might be another way to tackle it of, well, let's try changing some diet, but I think that might help secondarily, not necessarily directly with the mood. Okay, so, excuse me, let me make sure we have time. Okay, so here I just broke it down in a table. Actually, I stole this from one of the resources that I put at the end of the presentation. Oh, that's it, I forgot. Fluvoxamine is the other SSRI. Um, so flu, fluvoxamine, I've used in children a couple of times, but typically that again is only when they also have OCD because fluvoxamine has shown to be actually better than other SSRIs when it comes to OCD along a little bit with the sertraline. Uh, the nice thing though, is this also shows you the formulation. So if you've got a kiddo that's not swallowing pills yet, 
or can't. There, some do come in a suspension. Um, and then this tells you kind of the, the dose range. Interestingly enough, um, so I know for fluoxetine, typically in kids, I do the initial dose of 10 milligrams. Um, but I have some younger ones that I try on five milligrams. And just this past week, I got denied by, by insurance because the dose was too low, but the kid is only seven. So we got it approved, but it was just a whole nother process. Um, and then, oh, this is my other one, a paroxetine. So I didn't even put it in the, in that one, um, in the resource that I gave you guys at the end, paroxetine is actually on this table. I just took it off um, because it is not recommended in kids. There's too many side effects because it has anticholinergic effects. It's not a clean SSRI. Um, and there's a lot of risk for withdrawal from the medication. So although paroxetine has been around for a long time, it's a good medication. I, it, it's a good medication, but it is very difficult to get people off of. And it's very difficult on them. If they miss a dose here and there, they just feel so miserable and they rarely get that with any of the other SSRIs. So I would not recommend uh, paroxetine in kids. Um, here are our non-SSRIs. So this is again, where we're working a little more with the dopamine or the norepinephrine system. Um, so of all these medications, duloxetine is the only one that has an FDA approved indication in children, which is for generalized anxiety specifically. Um, but I will use some of these off label. Um, yeah, especially if I've got a kiddo that's just very amotivational or having a hard time with attention and focus. And I don't feel like a, like a stimulant is really indicated or they don't want to take it or for whatever reason, I will, I will put a lot of my adolescents, especially on Wellbutrin or Bupropion as generic. Um, it, they've got these other formulations. I just go with XL. I don't waste my time with the SR or just the Bupropion because even the Bupropion SR is supposed to be dosed twice a day. So it's just, it's a pain. And even though it's an ER 12 hour tablet, it tends to make falling asleep very difficult. So typically even the SR dosing, you're supposed to dose like at 8 a.m. and noon or like the early afternoon. And that's just realistically to me a very hard thing for people to take. So I just tend to go with the XL one dose in the morning. Um, mirtazapine. Because I don't know, you guys may or may not remember, but tends to make people pretty sleepy. So does trazodone. So those I tend to encourage them to take them at night. Um, everybody's a little bit different. And then the duloxetine and venlafaxine are kind of a same with SSRIs as far as the sleepiness. Some kids feel it, some kids don't, some feel more alert and awake. So if that's the case at home, just switch it to morning or night, whatever seems to make the most sense. Um, as far as trazodone goes, we don't use it a whole lot for depression. Um, because you tend to need such high doses to actually treat depression. And then it tends to make people feel so sleepy, but we still use it a lot. I still use it in kids uh, to help with sleep difficulties that are more than likely related to their depression or anxiety. Um, and then you'll see my note here. Although interesting, again, the same kid, the other actually has two insurances and the other insurance is refusing Prozac fluoxetine because I'm prescribing for generalized anxiety. Um, and they told me that I should be using duloxetine, uh, venlafaxine or desvenlafaxine, which is Pristique. I'm assuming because they're the SNRIs, so they're just getting lumped in with some both, but there is absolutely really no research of Pristique in children. And the research with venlafaxine in children and adolescents is equivocal. Um, it really doesn't show much benefit for the management of depression kids, although there are some that do respond. So it's not the worst, but I definitely wouldn't go with these for first line. Okay, and then the black box warning, which I really wanna to talk to you guys about because I know a lot of primary care tends to be kind of nervous of this. So to give you the history, it was in 2004 that the FDA released the black box, black box, oh, sorry, black box warning um, regarding suicidal thinking, feeling and behavior in young people. So they made this recommendation after a meta-analysis of all these RCTs of antidepressants in adolescents showed suicidal thinking or behavior was 4% in the medicated group and 2% in the non-medicated group. 
So to them, that was a statistical difference because it was too, it was twice as high. Well, let's get real. 4% is still really low, especially when we're talking about a group of kids who are depressed and who have suicidal thoughts. In all of these studies, there were no actual suicide attempts. Well, then what they've seen since 2004 is, because prior to that in the late 90s and early 2000s, there actually was a pretty significant pickup in the prescription of SSRIs from primary care, family practice, pediatrics, internal medicine, really getting better about identifying people with depression and anxiety and treating it. Um, but that definitely took a dip after this black box warning came out. And then I started doing my training in 2010. And I feel like even since then, I still get a lot of referrals from primary care that would probably in 2000 would have been just been handled in primary care. But I think there's still a lot of fear of this black box warning. So when I'm discussing with my families, this is exactly what I told them. I said, so in the medication group, there's 4%. The non-medicated group, it was 2%, still a low number. There were no suicides during the studies, but the warning got put out because the FDA was concerned. Um, but I don't believe the medication necessarily causes suicidal thoughts. I think that's part of depression. It's literally a diagnostic criteria. Um, but I also tell them like, if those thoughts start happening or if they start changing or if they are getting worse or more severe, then I want either that kid or that parent to call my clinic and we're going to change. So my stance on this is pragmatically, as long as I keep that door open, I say, Hey, you call me. If you've got problems, you call me. The, we'll blame the medication. I'm not going to go at them. I'm not going to ham and haw and try to decide, well, were those thoughts really there first? Or was it really the medicine? I'm just going to change. We have other meds. So especially if this is first or second time, we switch to something else. And then we also still get them into therapy. We get them into other resources that can help with those thoughts and help them learn how to, you know, live with their depressive symptoms. But that's kind of the stance I've taken. And I feel like I have a lot more people that are willing to start the medication and then find out that it does very good for them. So anyway, because of that concern, the FDA did kind of amend the black box warning in 2007 to state, well, okay, depression itself is also associated with increased risk of suicide, um, but it doesn't seem that that's had a big effect on the prescribing numbers. Um, then I just wanted to, we won't go through this really in depth, but this is basically where we derive our data, why our treatment algorithms for depression. These are the hallmark articles that we learned in training. So the TADS study was a randomized control trial. Um, this one was kind of modeled, I don't know, I won't say that. So anyway, what they did is they took, they had four arms, they had fluoxetine alone, CBT alone, fluoxetine with CBT or placebo um, for 12 weeks. And in the end, um, it was believed that fluoxetine plus CBT performed better than fluoxetine alone, which performed better than CBT alone, which performed better than placebo. Um, and then interestingly, they did discuss suicidality, which decreased in all arms of the study. And then the other one is the ADAPT trial, uh, kind of similar, so they did fluoxetine alone, fluoxetine plus CBT for 12 weeks, and then there's a 16 week follow-up. Um, I think the ADAPT trial occurred in Europe and TADS was in um, America and they were, they, they kind of, they occurred very si at similar times. So I think that's why they had very similar um, design. The ADAPT says that the treatments were equivalent. Um, so it was a little bit different of results from TADS, but they also acknowledge the cost and time involved in CBT. Um, so that being said, we still wanna treat with medication if at all possible. It definitely has the highest percentage of remission, but CBT is still a very appropriate and valid treatment option. Okay. Whew, sorry, I feel like that went kind of quick because I wanted to save some time for us to discuss. Um, these are the two main sites. So if you go to the American Association of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, which typically if you are a member of AAP, right, American Academy of Pediatrics, I think we have a lot of um, overlapping stuff because I remember when I... I let my ACAP membership lapse this year. But I remember when I was in ACAP, we also 
we're able to get free copies of like the pediatrics journal and some of the other pediatric specialties like neurology and stuff. So I don't know if it goes, if it's a two-way street, but there are a lot of free resources on ACAP. So you don't even have to be a member. Um, I'll often print out the facts for families, um, which shows basically just the, it discusses the diagnoses, kind of discusses the symptoms and things they can do. There are specific parent medication guides on there. So there's one for SSRIs. That's where I stole those tables from. But there's also resources for clinicians on there that are, these are all like any random person go to the website and access these without logging in. Um, and then this one is from your guys' team on really trying to identify and treat depression in primary care. So I will get out of here. And I guess open the floor to any questions at all, um, cases to present, please speak up. We typically are a quiet group, um, but yes, if there are cases to present, please go ahead and discuss those now if you'd like to ask Dr. Jolly a question. Um, and you can unmute yourself and go ahead and do that. Dr. Jolin, I'm not sure if you want to unshare your screen. Oh, I can do that, sure. You can stop sharing and then we'll come back. You can turn your cameras on. Hopefully people have had their opportunity That's to have right. lunch. Okay. I was trying to see what people, there we go, okay. Yeah. We're gonna see a bunch of names. So if you can turn your cameras back on and join the community and have conversation regarding our depressed youth in North Dakota and um, the ways in which we can work towards treating them or any other questions you have uh, regarding depression in adolescents. or not. So I would say I focus today just on major depression, but I would say comorbidity is the rule. Um, the vast majority of these kids are going to also meet criteria for at least an anxiety disorder. Um, and then technically disruptive mood dysregulation disorder and major depression can co-occur. Um, that DMDD is a new DSM diagnosis. Um, so a lot of times it is also taking in the comorbidities to help guide treatment, um, or substance use is unfortunately common, um, in this population and trying to address some of those things can help a lot too, but might be difficult. When we talked about some of the precursors to things that children may be experiencing prior to like the symptoms of prior to having the suicidal thoughts or are having suicidal thoughts and before attempting suicide, um, like the giving away of the things, right? And, and starting to have the discussions of, um, are you seeing more in the kids of the spontaneous suicidal, like within five minutes, within 10 minutes, that's the decision that they're making? Are you hearing about that more? Um, I would say it's almost like there's, it's like an inverse um, bell curve or maybe I guess we'll just say the bell curve and then the extremes here where there's, there's just a good handful of kids, especially the first attempt seems to be very impulsive. Um, but then I've got that bit, that group of kids here where they're kind of got recurrent suicidal ideation, repeated suicide attempts. Um, so like those ones, that's what I'm here for. You guys send those ones my way. Um, that's the goal. And even DHS is trying to do this. And I don't know if any of you guys have been feeling like you're getting some kids from DHS. Um, but the shift has been where basically they want us available to see the sickest of the sick. So the SMI, the severe emotionally disturbed is what they call children, which doesn't have any other clarification. Um, so that basically the kids who are beating people up at school, escaping the classroom, shutting down, won't talk to anybody, crawling under desks and making animal noises. Um, those kind of kids, the kids are not making to school, a lot of trauma, that kind of stuff can come to me and I can handle that as long as we can have you guys handle this stuff that's more first line stuff. Or once we get these kids doing a lot better, trying to hand off back to primary care for ongoing management. Um, it's kind of the goal so that basically when these really intense ones are there, we have time to see them because I'm not seeing a bunch of stable kids. Um, so I don't know if you guys have run into that at all, or if there's a comfort level, basically, once I get kids to that point, I ask parents to reach out to primary care and say, Hey, 
this is the situation. Dr. Dalton thinks they're doing fine. They just want to stay on the meds. Will you guys take over? And I get mixed responses. So some are okay with it. Some aren't. I, I'm like, okay. I think one of our hopes in that is that we would be able to utilize the consult line through the pediatric mental health care access program. So if there's any concerns, questions along the way that the child and adolescent psychiatry team, the consult line could be accessed and we could help guide the process in that as well, whether it's the next recommendation or if they're titrating a medication or mm -hmm. maybe taking one off and going on to a different one, how to, you know, titrate that down. Um, so Hopefully we can utilize the access line for that. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I tell all of my families too, if, if it's mine, as I tell them, they can call me. I have no problem if they reach out to me or if we do like a nurse to nurse relay thing. Like, and I think that makes a lot of the parents because I, I would say, actually, I think it's more my parents are anxious about going to primary care than primary care is not willing to take it on. I, I, I don't, I don't go following up. <laughs> But I have a good feeling because a lot of them kind of get into this. And it, it, it has been the culture now, like I said, since basically the later 2000s, it's been a, the culture that like, well, I just go to my psychiatrist for this, or I just go to my therapist for this. And it's kind of all about kind of destigmatizing things and saying, no, this is part of your health. Like I, as your primary care, need to know about these things and I can help you with these and you can talk to me about these things. It doesn't have to be so siloed, but I think it's been that way for so long that it's kind of hard to get back to that. Any questions from the attendees? One of the things I will say is I've been traveling to the clinics in rural North Dakota. I've met some of you out there. Um, and talking about the program and realizing just how very much space there is between clinics and towns and the distance one has to travel in order to get to see someone like you, Dr. Jolin. Um, so folks that are in the north um, west side of the state and how many hours that is to travel to Bismarck to see somebody. So it's, it's quite um, a gift if the family can stay local and be treated locally without having to make the several hour drive to Bismarck and then back. Um, to get care. Yeah. Well, and just to um, try to share something. So there are no, no, I don't even think adult psychiatrists or no psychiatrists west of the Missouri River um, right. in this state. So, but um, Dr. Laura Shield, who is a child psychiatrist from Bismarck, is currently doing telehealth to the Human Service Center in Williston. I did it for a while and then she took over. And then she, I think, sees a couple kids in Dickinson. Dr. Damon does some telehealth to Dickinson. Um, and then he covers home on the range, which is like in beach, I think. Um, I do currently now I'm back to, I'm at one day a week of telehealth to Minot. And then, um, cause Dr. Martinson is there with Dakota Family Services, but I think he's at the point where he's not taking a lot of new clients. And then my understanding is there is another child psychiatrist at Dakota Trinity. Um, and then there's a, new nurse practitioners up there um but yeah it there's not a lot and so but those options do exist so we i've been doing telehealth since way before covid um but actually for a while there for a long time i was doing a day and a half in my not but i just recently made a change with my schedule so i had to cut back my hours up there um but so those options do exist up there if you guys are feeling like i don't know what else to do um so even though so like i said that the DHS qualifications is they're supposed to be super extreme and sick, but especially in Williston, Minot and Dickinson, and then even um, Devil's Lake, their threshold is a little bit lower because we know there are no other community resources. So they are typically taking kids in that are not quite as severe as what we kind of expect in Bismarck, Fargo, Grand Forks. Um, so I think it's worth having them refer over there and doing the assessment. Um, if you feel like you need that help, I, I, I think most of the time they're saying yes. So. I just wanted to say if people have an opportunity to take a peek at the, um, ndpmhca.org website. The resources that Dr. Jalen had referenced on her last slide are also within our um, website. And I could just do a quick share screen if that's okay. Um, and you can take a, 
guide to that. Um, so I'm sharing the screen now, and this is the diagnostic folder for depression and bipolar. And on here, you're gonna have your symptomologies there. The screeners are also listed and you can print those out there in English and Spanish. It'll tell you the age and population that they're evidence-based for. Um, you can go ahead and click on the English version, print it, Spanish version, print it, et cetera. Um, so those are listed. And then the treatment, um, treatment guidelines, best ones, um, evidence-based are listed, medications, CBT with parents, family therapy. The GLAD is also posted there if you wanna click on that and download and print it. The therapist aid, if there's therapist on the line here, I think I see a couple, um, to go ahead and go through CBT tools, um, which is a great resource aid there. And then other evidence-based sheets for bipolar, um, billing and coding guidance for, actually, if you use the screeners, as pediatricians, there's actually different billing codes that are available to add for complexities to the visit. Um, so you're reimbursed for the time that you're taking to do these screeners. Um, and that is posted through and linked to the American Academy of Pediatrics. There's education sheets in there. Um, also our previous, um, for the last several years, we've been doing different speakers and different vantage points regarding depression. Um, disruptive mood dysregulation is also listed from our previous um, echo sessions. Um, websites are listed here and it gives a description as to why each website was selected, um, evidence-based and like really credible content websites um, you can go to for either depression or bipolar disorders. There's podcast opportunities that people can go to for teens, teens and depression, um, NPR parenting tips for children with bipolar disorder, different apps that are assistive as well with the day of technology and social media and having phones and hands by most um, to go ahead and take advantage of some of the apps that are there, the fact sheets for children and families, and then articles that are there and, and just books. So we have these folders for each one of um, a whole host of diagnoses that we've been going through. So we have, I'll stop clicking on it once, maybe. There, um, acquired brain injury, anxiety, ADHD, autism, behavioral challenges, depression, et cetera. So there's um, a drop down for each one of those categories. If you want to take a peek over there and get resources to print out. Any questions at all? I know we usually have a quiet group. Sorry, Dr. Jolin. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. No, I it's it was a pleasure being invited. I hope I was able to be helpful for you guys. I mean, too fast, too slow. I don't know. So if um, I think my email it should be on the front of the slide, or maybe you can get a hold of Jen. Please email me if you have any other questions. Or um, so in another month I'm gonna do a discussion on autism. Well, uh. -huh. That's a lot more broad than I would like to believe it is. And so if you guys have like really any specific things that you want to make sure that I talk about next month, please tell me, or like I said, please give me some feedback if this was not helpful, if it was too simple, not, you know, too in depth to whatever, please let me know so I can change that. I'm currently so much more used to teaching med students. So I <laughs> change. yeah, it's just a different dynamic. I want to get to what you need. So, and I really want to encourage our audience, and if you chime in again for another one, to think of a, a, of a kiddo that you're going to have that maybe you work with already who has depression or who has anxiety, um, autism, and you want to address like what you're doing, what has worked, what hasn't worked, um, and where to go from here, basically, and, and utilize the expertise we have in the ECHOs. That is definitely the session design. Um, an ECHO, the first 20-ish, half hour minutes are used for the didactics and then the rest of it is supposed to be case exchange um, staffing and then learning really as a community of practice together so that we can all learn how these things play out like this is what this person did and it was helpful and then using that knowledge to really extrapolate into your own cases um, in your own panel of patients so that you can take what you just learned today and apply it and we can continue to broaden the field of knowledge for everyone. So I invite you to come prepared next time with a, maybe a homework assignment of thinking about a kiddo that you have on your case that who has um, autism and you'd like to talk through some of the treatments that you would like to or have tried if they've worked great and if you need guidance more then please ask that. 
Um, we are winding down in the hour, but if you have not yet completed the evaluation and the post test, please click on those links in the evaluation. If there's things you want to hear more about, um, you can go ahead and put those in there. If there's questions you have, comments, please put them in there. It helps to guide us into the content that we want to deliver next year. So we will have another echo series for next year um, with perhaps some swap outs of topics, um, but we would like to always get that information from our audience. So thank you everybody for attending today. Dr. John, I'm sure you're gonna have one o'clock. So if you, <laughs> if you want uh, three minutes back into your day, um, uh, unless somebody has a question. Okay. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa.